Now I understand a lot of you guys are also tensed, worried about Sushant. What is happening? There are fears of recession. There are fears of bad news coming out. Now please understand. Let's zoom out a little bit, right? Till now, only good news was in the market. We went from twenty-two thousand to twenty-five thousand. We hit the twenty-five thousand mark as well. But when there is too much good news, that is also a problem because then one small bad news will tumble the entire ecosystem, and that is exactly what happened. Now, please understand why this entire downfall has happened. It is not one thing. It is actually two to three different things that have contributed to this problem. Right? It all started with two things. Whenever a stock market goes up too much, it is also because there's a lot of greed in the market. Even when we saw the 2008 crash happening, there was a lot of greed in the market, which led to people, bankers, getting very greedy, over leveraging themselves, and then everything came crashing down. Similar thing happened here as well. Now, the first thing we will look at is Japan. Now, Japan earlier in the past was going through a very tough time, and then Japan launched something called a scary trade. Okay, now I know you guys have heard about scary trade, but let me explain in a very simple term what Japan was doing. Basically, Japan was saying, "I have this currency called yen. I want everyone in the world to borrow money from me, and I will give it to you at zero interest rate. Basically, I will give you free money. It's not free money. You have to pay the principal back, but I will give you interest-free money." Now, what people thought, or what hedge funds thought, that okay, wait, yen is a depreciating currency, just like Indian currency. Also, it over time keeps going down. We don't get stronger, so yen is also going down. So I can take yen today, and when I have to pay, repay it back, I can pay it little lesser. So what they did is they borrowed yen from, uh, let's say, the country of Japan. A lot of yen they borrowed these hedge funds, and what they did is they took this money and just invested it in USD. Now what happens? USD is going up. Let's say yen to USD goes up by five percent. I think India almost seven eight percent. It went up in the last one year. So let's assume USD went up by around seven to ten percent. Yen is there, right? So now what they did? They got a simple arbitrage. They borrowed money from yen, invested in a stronger currency, and they made the difference of that. Now this was one set of the bankers. The next set of bankers said, "What do you mean? Why should we invest in USD even though it's so safe? Let's go a little more aggressive." So what they did, they borrowed from yen and they said, "Let me invest in some nice IT companies in US, right? Which might go up." So that's why they invested in a lot of IT companies in US. Then the next sector came where they said, "You know what? Why IT companies in US? Let's go to India and invest in Indian equities also, right? Because this is interest-free money. I have to just pay back the principal." They became and started investing in India. Similarly, they also invested in crypto, and that is why they started investing in different asset classes. Now, all this was fine, and Japan was enjoying because people are borrowing yen, and everything was okay. But what happened slowly is U.S. started creating an issue. Two things happened in U.S. One, Intel ka news came out where what happened with Intel and even Tesla actually, not just Intel. People ignore Tesla, but both the results of Intel and Tesla were bad, and the asset classes that these hedge funds were investing in suddenly was not very attractive. Now, please wait. I have to still pay the loan to the Japanese bank, but interest free. But that means I'm investing in assets that have to go up. If the assets go up, then I can take out my profit and pay it back to Japan, right? That was the game. But now what happened is the assets which were going up suddenly started coming down, and Bank of Japan at the same time said, "Boss, I have to make my currency stronger because my currency became very weak. So I'm going to now put interest on this loan, and I'm going to put 0.25 interest. So now what happened? The free money, interest-free money, became a with interest. So this went up." The yen became stronger, right? Went from 167 to 147, and all the people who borrowed yen to invest in great assets, which are going up, those assets started coming down. So what happened? You see the squeeze that happened, and now what happened is all these guys had to sell all these assets to come and pay back their loan to this company, so that everything is fine and everything is clear. And that is why you see a global sell-off happening. Weirdly, also happened in the crypto market. Ideally, crypto market should not go. But when we saw Ethereum falling by 20 percent, I understood that a A lot of this Japanese money was also in India, and then we saw Australian dollar creating an issue. That means a lot of people in Australia also have picked up this money. India had also picked up a lot of yen, but it did not affect us so much. And US also picked up a lot of yen. So now what happened is everyone had to liquidate that and buy the yen and give it back to the bank. So this was the entire global sell-off that happened, which created a mild problem in the global scale. But from a DII front, which is domestic institutional investors, the mutual funds in India, we were safe. Why? Because we have a strong DII base. 
people like me and you doing SIPs and that basically helped the market go up and or actually not go up but keep it in a steady zone. But to be honest if I ask you do you think the market was overvalued? Yes, the market was overvalued. It had gone to a very greedy position. We had reached 25,000 very, very, very fast, right? And that is why we saw the entire thing tumbling. Now, let me show you a quick, some quick graphs. So this is the Japanese index. As you can see, the Japanese index fell down. And if you look at it from a long time perspective, it kept going up. And then the Japanese index actually fell uh, quite a bit from 39,000 to it fell down to 31,000 and today it went back up by 10% because there was some recovery. If you look at our nifty in the morning we thought there was a recovery but then towards the evening it again fell down and as you see we had hit 25,000 so there was a correction coming into place and 24,000 was our first line of defense. Always the round numbers are the first line of defense. If we break 24,000 the next support seems like only around 23,300. So if this breaks and we don't rebound from this and bad news continues in the world, this will go down. Another two things that are contributing in the ecosystem are the Iran and Israel situation. Now that is again creating a problem. Why? Because Russia came and said, I'm supporting Iran. US came and said, I'm supporting Israel. Now if both of them fight, automatically we saw in the market that the oil prices started going up in the world. Right. So if you look at the oil prices, there has been a rise in oil prices suddenly because people are now uh, people are now imagining that oil is going to become a problem because demand supply gap is going to be affected. Now, if oil companies go up, then then your companies in India will get affected because your margins will start getting contracted. People have to pay more for oil, and people who are oil dependent countries. In fact, India is also a very big oil dependent country, and companies like Asian Paints will now start doing bad because the raw materials required is coming from oil itself. So a lot of these impacts are also going to become an issue. But every time there is a global war like this, is it a bad thing? See, sometimes it can be a good thing also. And I'll tell you why. For example, in Bangladesh, something terrible is happening. And we saw that people have been running away from Bangladesh. The, the prime minister of Bangladesh actually went away, came to India, and now she's trying to seek asylum in some other country. There's been riots going on. Bangladesh is shut down. We cannot fly to Bangladesh. Mad things happening in, in Bangladesh, right? But do you know what was Bangladesh as a chief exporter? Right? Bangladesh was the textile hub of Asia. Now what happens if the textile hub of Asia goes into a problem like this? Now if you see the crisis that is happening in Dhaka, people are saying that we cannot stop production, but production is stopped in Dhaka and they, I mean Bangladesh and they were one of the biggest exporters of textile. So now they might start moving away from there to come to India because India is the closest good substitute that is there and a lot of people are saying that Tirupur will become one of the biggest hubs. But I don't know whether it will be Tirupur or not, that we don't know. But one thing I know for a fact that today all your textile companies started flying up. The companies like Nahar Spinning went up by 10%. Uh, so many different companies have started going up today and textile might see an impact coming from textile substitution that might benefit us. Now all this is assuming that Bangladesh does not come back on their feet and they still continue to go down and they still continue to suffer. But if that does not happen, then I think we will see this going back up or creating a very quick rebound on the same front. Yeah. Coming back to the last part. So guys, I would say if you're invested in very risky assets, I would be very careful right now. I would say don't stay invested in very risky assets. Keep your allocation in a very safe portfolio because the uh, tension is not over. The tension is only building from now on. So I would not stay invested in high risk assets at this point. I personally have uh, cut down my portfolio and I've gone into safe FMCG bets, uh, safe companies uh, like Reliance, TCS, ITC, all of that, HDFC Bank. Those type of companies is what I'm now accumulating because I'm looking at this as a dip and any good dip comes with good companies coming at attractive P's. So I will keep looking at companies that have attractive P's as well and I will keep buying them. So if you want to know more about all of this, I will keep putting more videos out. But also if you want very quick updates, you can follow me on the YouTube community where I'm constantly giving updates of what is happening in this space. This is me, Shashank Gurupa, signing off. Any doubts, any questions you have about connecting the dots, put it in the comment section below. Thank you guys. Bye.